Thank you so much for having me on and for being interested in what the um, maybe nebulous activities of the, the state society have been. Um, I hope for them not to be so nebulous in the future, have a really tight connection with chapter activities. So um, get into it. So <clears throat> at, at the state level, in nearly every meeting, the mission is referenced. So what is our mission? Conserve, preserve, and restore the native plants and native plant communities of Florida. So geographically limited to Florida, native plant communities and native plants. So not just individual species, but also the wider habitats of the native plant communities. And then the three things we do, conserve, preserve, and restore. So conserve existing ecosystems, preserve things, and then restore ecosystems that have been degraded, and including you know, landscape ecosystems. So this is a graphic from the website. It might be a little bit small, um, but we have a pretty complicated organizational structure for not being a very large organization. So we're 44,000-ish members, a little above. Um, we upticked recently. I like to think it's because of the Lunch and Learns and the uh, Members Only Facebook group, which have people checking to see whether or not there are, they are members. Because it's very easy to let your membership expire and you, know, you only get a, you know, an email notification and a couple of email notifications and maybe a letter uh, if you leave it for long enough. So um, I think more people are becoming aware that you know, membership is important to us as a society because it shows how many people are personally invested in Florida's native plants. And that's our sun there in the corner, our source of energy. So thank you, everyone. Um, and we are organized into chapters, of course, so like a little federation of chapters. And those chapters are represented to the larger society within uh, a organization called the Council of Chapters. So every chapter is supposed to have a chapter representative, which represents your chapter's interest to the board. And so what are your chapter's interests? You might be very concerned about, you know, state level policy or local level policy issues, or are we getting new educational materials? Um, are we working on landscaping initiatives? Um, is your local conservation land safe? So those are interests that you might want the society to be pursuing and that your chapter rep uh, should be communicating your interests to the board of directors. Uh, the board of directors, of course, is my boss's boss. So my boss is Juliette Rainier, who is the executive director, and her boss is the board of directors. And that is, uh, there's the XCOM, which is the executive committee, council representatives, directors at large, and committee chairs. Um, and so those board meetings, we have board meetings. We were having quarterly in-person board meetings and I'm not sure if we're going to be having, I have not been asked to organize a um, virtual board meeting. I know that they are having uh, virtual board meetings. But anyways, those are open to the public and of course members, if you want to attend, um, those are scheduled on the team up calendar you can see on most of your um, most of your chapter websites. And if you're not on an email list that includes that information, I'd be happy to help you get on it. Um, we work a lot with our partners, so we're really tightly entwined with the Florida Association of Native Nurseries, or FAN. Um, we also, we just signed an MOU during our annual meeting with the Florida Wildflower Foundation and um, other, we don't work super tightly with the Fresh, Fresh for Florida Fresh from Florida campaign, or currently the Wildflower Seed Co-op. Um, and I don't know, partners and supporting organizations I would consider to be very similar. So, you know, the Florida Forest Service, um, Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, who have, you know, rare plant, I will discuss them more, Florida Fish and Wildlife, DEP, water management districts. Um, we have both local and state level connections and coordination with organizations such as, such as those. And then the roots are our mission. Okay, so that's, that's a very broad overview. So we have these, these five areas of focus on how we carry out our mission. And number one is conservation. I mean, in, as you'll see, the majority of my presentation is gonna be focused on conservation because that is almost all of what we do. Florida has huge conservation needs and we're working really, really hard to try and fill those needs despite being quite a small, organiza 
small organization with only a few staff members. Okay, yeah, so how many staff members do we have? So we have Juliet, who is the first ever full-time hire. She's the executive director. She was hired a couple months before I was. I was hired in September 2018. I'm full-time. Um, and then we have Lily Anderson Messick, who is our Torre Keepers coordinator in the Panhandle. And we have an intern, Joanna Munoz, who is in Orlando. And she's a grant funded position. So four technically right now, uh, but she, uh, neither Lily or Joanna are uh, full time. Okay, so, and then we have our certain people who carry out the mission. And I missed staff, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so members, chapter board members, FMPS board members, FMPS partners, and FMPS staff. Of course, all staff are members, uh, so I guess we're technically included in number one. So we're going to start with conservation. And I, th I thought when I started this presentation that I was going to draw lines to conservation and which, which of these four did each one, but everybody does a little bit of everything in this organization. We don't even though we're very specialist in botany and very specialized in conservation, uh, we don't have a lot of specialized roles in society. Everybody is rather a jack of all trades. I mean, chapter board members do conservation research, FMPS board members do landscaping. It's, it's we're very, uh, we're, we're very good at cross pollinating. So here's an example of local chapter doing conservation. Papa chapter has a program called Rugal's Roundup. Um, their, their chapter is named after Rugal's Papa, Asmina Rugaliai, or some people say Asimina. I don't know what the correct pronunciation is. And that was recently reclassified from during the famness. So this was a, uh, it's a very odd looking small papa. So everybody has papas. We have statewide papas. And uh, this is a, a narrow endemic to Volusia County. You can see the map on the top right. Uh, it's most most populations are in Tiger Bay State Forest, which is um, west of Daytona Beach, west of Mormon Beach, uh, west of Port Orange, in between uh, Deland and Volusia County. And so they have a program called Rubles Roundup where they do site surveys, propagation, restoration. Um, they even do tissue culture. It's very good collaboration. So this is an example of you know the state organization hasn't been you know broadly involved in their local conservation work, and they've done a great job in in protecting the species and making sure it's managed properly. So, you know, they, they collect data and provide data to land managers to help this, this uh, population in Tiger Bay State Forest thrive. <clears throat> so this is a statewide program, scrub balm research and restoration. We have uh, a grant from Duke Energy and another from Florida Power and Light to do um, site surveys and restoration of both Dicerandra cornatissima and Dicerandra modesta. So these are plants, uh, endemic endangered plants in the mint family. And uh, this, the photo of us here on the right side is that's Joanna on the left, our intern, volunteer, me, another volunteer, um, right after a planting day. So we were actually alerted to this population in the, well, we, we knew about this population in the Marjorie Harris car across Florida Greenway um, near Oh, somebody on Prairie, Ross Prairie. So it's in like the Ross Prairie tract of the Marjorie Harris car across Florida Greenway. And we were alerted to this by a um, very outraged post in Florida Flora and Ecosystematics where uh, a botanist was appalled that they had, that um, I think the Florida Trail or, yeah, they put this paved Florida Trail through a population of Dicerandra and that, you know, nobody had stopped them and why wasn't anyone paying attention? So um, we are helping to restore associated habitat so that the Dicerandra, you know, that population is not extricated. So you can see us standing by that paved trail <laughs> near the location of the Dicerandra. And there's a photo of Dicerandra cornatissima. So that's the species in Marion County. So these are, these are pretty narrow endemics. And uh, so the Dicerandra cornatissima is in Lake in Marion County and Dicerandra modesta is one protected population in Polk County. So I don't have any of the Polk County photos. Um, but we did a lot of very hard work in the, the Polk County area. And there's there's me and a volunteer and augering holes for um, uh, plants that we brought in. So, you know, these areas have been disturbed and instead of letting the Bahia grass and the tall grass re-encroach, um, managing these areas for 
uh, high quality habitat so that the dicerandra can flourish. So we um, buy plants from the natives nursery in Davenport who use um, local eco ecotype seed and then we bring in the plants and get volunteers and then we plant them. And this is grant funded work of course. So and we have a lot of help from the Marion Big Scrub chapter in this. Another statewide project is the Silverland Springs restoration. We work with Green Isle Gardens and um, the Florida Forest Service in Silverland Springs in the Ocala National Forest to uh, plant natives to prevent erosion. So they had an engineer, and I don't have a good photo of this, but you can see there's some, some elevation change. So there was a lot of erosion occurring because of the, the high population load in this area. You know, people are just, um, you see in this bottom left-hand corner, you see where this truck is. Basically, there's maybe a 40 foot drop down into the boil and people could just walk down and um, the rain would flow down and wash all the sand into the boil and the entire area around Silverland Springs is an archaeological site. So this was particularly bad because, you know, <laughs> historic artifacts and, uh, you know, evidence of, you know, long-term inhabitation of the site was literally washing into the boil along with sedimenting in the boil. So uh, their engineer engineered us uh, a plan of, of these, these berms covered in coconut core. You can see the, the coconut core here. And then we cut holes in the coconut core and planted a uh, really wide diversity of native plants that the people had to snake around and to walk down into the boil uh, to, to access, the, access the springs. And so it looks gorgeous. It's uh, an incredible project. and. Uh, Then up in the panhandle, our, one of our, our only work on endangered tree that I'm aware of is our Trey Keepers project. There's Lily Anderson Messick in the right hand side, uh, looking saucy. And uh, we have endangered tree, the Terea taxifolia, known as Florida Terea, or the stinking cedar. And this tree is very affected by a fungus. And uh, we're working, we have partnered, yeah, partners with um, Atlanta Botanical Garden. At who is doing fungicide and tissue culture research, and we are spearheading the landowner outreach. So most most Terea is on Terea State Park. However, there there are unknown numbers of population unknown populations on private land, and so we, this project is actually a couple years old, and it was run mostly by um, excuse me by volunteers and um, private contractors until we recently acquired the capacity for staff, thus me and Lily and Juliet, to you know, run these projects a little more consistently. And uh, so basically we do surveys on private land, we cage plants and there's other, you know, we take other measurements and research to, to see if we can understand the plant better. So we can influence its conservation and management. And then one of our projects that is pretty Central Florida focused simply because many other chapters don't do rescues um, is our ongoing Central Florida rescues in the Claremont area and we have long-standing relationships with water management districts, uh, county parks, and other concerns and state parks to um, bring these plants from development sites when they're about to get bulldozed or even if they are not yet about to get bulldozed create relationships with the landowners so that um, we can collect seeds and then propagate them uh, with our partner Green Isle Gardens so that we can have this locally adapted uh, local ecotype seed sources. So on the left that's Waria and Plexifolia from a seed collection effort um, in Lake County and it is flourishing at Lake Louisa State Park. This is a seedling of I'm not sure what, sorry, and then uh, loading up we get to use the park service gators at Lake Louisa State Park for planting. Um, but we don't just use Lake Louisa State Park. We have um, restoration at Little Italy and other places. And uh, if you'd like to know more about our restoration work in less than four weeks, on October 9th, we have the restoration of Little Italy with Rosie Mulholland. Uh, we worked with Rosie for years in restoring conservation areas in St. John's River Water Management District, including Little Italy, which is named so because it's shaped like the boot of Italy and it's on the Lake Apopka's North Shore. And so now that she's a private citizen, we're gonna hear from her and one of our merchandise. Stay tuned for that. For more conservation, we do 
what I would consider routine rare plant work, sort of being the go-to for, hey, I have a question about this rare plant. Hey, can you help me monitor? Hey, I'm working on this project. So in the top, we have Etnaya rosemary. <coughs> I'm getting a little cold. Conradina etonia. And um, this is at Etonia Creek State Forest, which is in Putnam County. It's on the left. We're here at a work day in October um, doing surveying for the species. And then there's the species on the right. And then the bottom, uh, Kara Driscoll of Naples Chapter, who's also the Council of Chapters Chair, is doing a statewide Asclepias fei survey, uh, which is Florida milkweed, or as she calls it, Florida fairy milkweed. And there's her looking optimistic at Triple N Ranch in Osceola County when I helped her survey and interviewed her. And um, whenever I get a spare moment, I will be uh, editing and releasing that interview so that everybody can see her perspective and what she's up to. But you can, if you're a member, you can look at your member, any of the emails I send out on Mondays or sometimes Tuesday or Wednesdays, Wednesdays if I'm having a hard time reaching the speaker. <laughs> um, every week I send out an email with lunch at the future lunch and learn information. So the lunch and learn that's happening that week and then also links to past lunch and learns. And it's good to check the email every week because sometimes I do get around to editing the old ones and posting them. So you, there might be a new one posted. Um, and Kara did a very good lunch and learn on Asclepias fei. And so again, another part of our routine rare plant work is participating in stuff like the rare plant task force meetings, which are more or less run by Bach Tower Gardens, and then the FDAC's rare plant advisory council. So we have a seat on that rare plant advisory council, which um, triages plants that are submitted for listing and decides, you know, whether something should be listed and also, you know, looks at evidence for plants that have been, that are rare, that we don't have a lot of information on or receiving new information on their population. And these sorts of things, you know, if you have any interest in being on these committees or learning more about what these committees do, feel free to contact me or contact Melanie and I can get you in touch with the committee chair or, you know, describe the duties a little bit more if you, if you are interested in, uh, you know, adding to your workload and maybe doing something more impactful for the plants of Florida. Another thing we do is we fund conservation grants. So annual grants of up to $5,000 for one year. Um, we have funded, you know, a couple of grants every year for a number of years. I haven't done the whole history on it. Um, I did uh, do a lunch and learn with uh, Martha Passaro, who did the Save the Bromeliads conservation project, which is on the um, the giant air plant, Talanzia triculata, and so she's based in Melbourne. Uh, she used to work at the Space Center, and so she does uh, the bromeliad restoration and research at uh, the Enchanted Forest Sanctuary in Melbourne. And so that was a really good presentation that I finally edited and got up. But um, I'm hoping to interview more uh, conservation grant recipients so that you know you can see our members can see where this where this grant funding is going to now of course grant funding is actually not membership funded so this is not like your membership dues going into this we actually have a conservation grant endowment so if you are really stoked about our conservation grants you can actually go to our website not this weekend on monday and you can go to our website you can donate specifically to conservation grants or if you're really savvy you can get together with your chapter like this happens every year is that chapters will get together and donate a, a chunk of money and then donate in honor of somebody. So, you know, in honor of Dick Workman and something like that. And then, you know, that funds an entire other award. So we're able to fund an additional award that we wouldn't have been able to fund that year because of the donations. So really great program. Another thing we do is we do policy to support conservation. So it's not you know, we're a pretty small organization with a pretty small budget, even in terms of conservation organizations in the state of Florida. I mean, I feel like we are very effective. We have a very solid social media reach and we have very, um, very involved and competent members. However, most conservation is done with government funding and government activity. And, you know, development rules are, <laughs> development rules and road building are governed by state statutes and, and state constitutions. So that is why we do state policy stuff and why we encourage chapters to do uh, policy stuff. Now, of course, these are all governed by 501c3 rules. So we're talking policy 
not politics. So policy is what the government does. Politics are, you know, I support XX candidate, I support XX, um, you know, political party, which we do not do as chapters or as the state level organization. Now, of course, you are still, and I am still free to support candidates, donate to candidates, but not as a part of the organization. So what we do is we, we educate and support policy. So we are a member of the No Roads to Ruin Coalition. Uh, that's a coalition to oppose the MCORS project, AKA the Toll Roads to Nowhere um, that were uh, signed into law recently. And so you can see Eugene Kelly's quote. He is our policy and legislation, legislation chair. Hopefully we'll have a lunch and learn with him, I think on the 16th of October, he'll be talking about sea level rise because he lives in the, the Big Bend nature coast region and he can see it every day. So this is his, this is his main issue right now. And, uh, but he does excellent work on behalf of our society, all volunteer. We also have a lobbyist, um, Sue Mullins, who works on, say for example, full Florida forever funding. That's basically been our main policy initiative for the past 10 years. We were every year, we support full Florida forever funding um, and we never get it. Um, and we also assist local chapters with your local issue advocacy. So we supported the Southeast chapters initiative who did field trips with their legislatures, legislators and trained their chapters on how to speak to your, your local legislative delegation. And then also, you know, you can get assistance with your local issues depending on Gene's um, time on. So for example, he helped me with my fight to save Split Oak, came and spoke um, representing the Florida Native Plant Society in opposition to the toll road through that conservation area. We have a policy committee that meets you know, while the legislature is in session and occasionally while the legislature is not in session. This is Broward chapter who, um, they did a great job wearing green and uh, uh, we're hoping to save executive airport natural areas. I asked um, Richard Brownscombe, who's the very happy looking guy, uh, third from the right, um, about an update for that. And they have not developed those natural areas yet. The executive airport hasn't, I don't have a, but he says it's still in limbo. Okay, so that is all conservation. <laughs> so we do so much conservation work. So for land management, we basically have one committee to cover land management. So land management partners committee and the land management partners committee, what they do takes care of the Florida Forest Service and Florida State Parks Management Plan. So for all of these larger conservation areas, Cape Florida, um, all over the Topsail Hill State Park, um, the Ocala National Forest, these are governed by land management plans. And so they have a very organized group of people who are experienced and it's a little difficult to get on the committee because you, you have to kind of know what you're doing in order to get on. But you can talk to Grace and Shadow and um, maybe one day become an experienced assessor of land management practices and recommend, um, recommend management changes that would um, improve the native plant habitat on certain properties that you may or may not be familiar with. So, um, but one way to get started is the land management partners committee does not cover FWC managed properties. So if you have a land management review for an FWC property coming up in your area, which I received the email notifications for those, um, I would be happy to loop you in and um, you can attend one of those. And they also have public hearings that you can voice your voice your opinions, you can, I mean, they release very much information, maps and burn histories and all this stuff that you can, you can read through and make recommendations based upon. Research is a significant part of our mission, but not a huge part of our day-to-day -day activities. So again, we, we hand out grants to cover research. So we have two grant programs that, that handle research, although the Daniel F. Austin Ethnobotany Award is not all research. It, it basically anything that is has to do with ethnobotany. And sometimes it's research and sometimes it's more, like for example, North Florida Heritage Garden Project was more of a um, gardening and educational activity, but sometimes they are research. <clears throat> and then the research committee is basically Paul Schmalzer <laughs> and he assesses the, the research grant recipients and uh, 
the awards and there's a there's a research committee so here he's presenting at the 2017 37th annual conference at Grover Ranch uh, he's a great researcher by the way you should definitely read his work on the um, the historical ecology of um, the Space Center the Kennedy Space Center really good stuff and we have given out a lot of research grants with a lot of really uh, funded a lot of really good research cool cactus work Croton linearis um, Florida Sisyphus. I mean, we have funded some really cool research, and I, I hope to get these researchers on Lush and Learns here pretty soon. Um, so then we also do education, and this is something that chapters do a lot of. You know, we have we pretty much the education, yeah, pretty much the education committee is over there on the right, Wendy Pogue, <laughs> and she has done these these beautiful. Um, bookmarks, which, as you can see, I have just moved into my place and I don't have any furniture in my office. And so I have some of these bookmarks, but I don't know where they are. So if you want them, I might be able to find them in the next month and mail them to you. So um, I don't know why I'm there on there twice. Sorry about my random self in the middle. Um, so educational, we produce educational materials and regularly we produce the Palmetto whose editor is Marjorie Shropshire, there in the top, and the Sable Miner, and I'm the editor of the Sable Miner. And then we also have our landscape brochures, and we just came out with a new brochure called Mo Less, and it's very nice. Um, and I actually do know where the My Box of Mo Less brochures are, so if you have a need for some brochures, you have a little free library, or some way to socially distance distribute these, I would be happy to send you some. And so that's pretty much all of the educational, all of the education work that we do on the state. So local chapters are our powerhouses of education. So plant sales, tabling, field trips, demonstration gardens. I mean, we have, chapters have some amazing demonstration gardens, but the ones that I'm most familiar with being the most impactful are this native park, one and two in Jacksonville. They even have a sign, a really huge sign for ICSIA chapter, and then the Cutting Horse Eco Center, which in Southwest Florida, which is run by Coca-Loba chapter, they got a grant for this from Florida Power and Light, and they have their own native plant nursery. The place is crawling with zebra longwings and passion um, and uh, gulf fritillaries. Um, it's just incredible. So thank you to our chapters who are doing this education work that we just don't have the staff to do, and um, we hope to be able to support you more in that educational work in the future uh, with, with more materials and, and perhaps some fiscal assistance. Statewide, we'd have, uh, we have had programming, one thing, the annual conference. So when I was hired as director of communications and programming, programming I asked them what was the programming part and you know the hiring committee looked around and they said the conference. <laughs> so when the conference was canceled, postponed this year to next year, uh, I thought, well, what's, <laughs> what happened to that part of my job? So I started doing these uh, weekly lunch and learns and um, they have become quite popular. And uh, so we've had, we had the conference. And so I've pretty much picked from presenters from the conference and, and been having them on the lunch and learns. But, Craig Hugel was going to be, that was our keynote, The Truth About Pollinator Gardens was our keynote for, for the conference this year. And uh, we also, I, I'm also helping out with the, these quarterly meetings. So this photo is from the Wakala quarterly meeting and you can see a collection of board members and, uh, and council of chapter representatives there. And so that usually includes lots of meetings, 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 meetings death by meeting, and then, then also some educational Stuff like a like a workshop on iNaturalist or a how to use Google Drive or something like that. So that's also educational. And the last area of focus is landscaping. This is also very chapter driven. So chapters do plant sales, especially for areas where we don't have native nurseries or we don't have enough native nurseries to serve the population. Chapters really have gone above and beyond in providing native plants to people. Uh, the opportunity to purchase native plants, and also information about you know which native plants work where, uh, propagating them, 
So if there's locally sourced seeds, such as something that Kogolova chapter does and um, Pawpaw chapter does, um, and uh, demonstration gardens help with landscaping. And the landscaping committee basically has one job, annual landscaping awards. And so not this past sable minor, but the sable minor before we had landscaping awards um, awarded. And so these are two landscapes in the villages that won our landscaping awards. And we also have, we funded um, last year a model land development code project, which is being run by my chapter president, Karina Vaudry, uh, to write a model land development code that includes native plants so that it's easily adoptable by counties and cities into their land development codes. So we don't have these. <laughs> there is a chance that we don't have these uh, awful land development codes in place that require the use of non-native plants in new residential and commercial developments. And that is all I have for that. Um, I was thinking I might talk to you guys a little bit about like, what is what are my days like? What do I do? So, um, oh, I put my phone number on there. Um, so, my job is fairly heavy on the computer work. I, we, I do a lot of you know internal communication, so a lot of emails. Uh, we're on the social media pages, of which we have many, and there's a lot of questions and responses. So I spend some time working on that, making sure there's always content there. Um, and uh, then I start working on, I have a massive video backlog. I've taken lots of video starting from the annual conference last year. Um, and I've interviewed a number of people, uh, a lot of, um, I'm currently working on Jackie Brawley's Florida Master Naturalist program um, for this, for the end of September. Um, you know, organizing the lunch and learn. So making sure that I have the right technology to make that work, um, promoting that properly. So making sure the graphics are good, um, you know, acquiring speakers, uh, emailing, setting up that, those weekly emails. Um, I have a, a monthly communications report, communications and programming report that you can read. It's, it's posted on the forum before every board meeting. I only send that to Juliet, but um, that pretty much has a report of all of my activities. Um, I do a little bit of fundraising. So, you know, we have fundraisers on Facebook and uh, we have a Teespring that you can buy Native Plant Society merchandise, including redesigned landscaping posters. So those landscaping brochures that fold down into the five by sevens, we were getting so many requests to buy them that I redesigned them so that they were, they're a large 18 by 24 glossy poster and uh, they're a little pricey at 21 bucks, but um, you just go to the Teespring store and, and buy it and they mail it to you. So um, that solves, <laughs> it was really a pain. Every time we ran the poster contest, we get like six or seven people. Why don't you have these for sale? So solve that problem. And I also work on the member database, you know, so if members say, oh, please change my email or, oh, I'm not getting your emails. Uh, I say, oh, I, I see that you received the email, but you didn't open it. Did it go to spam? Um, general tech support. I do a lot of general tech support for um, board members. Um, not my boss so much. She's definitely, she's pretty tech savvy, but you know, board members, president, um, chapter members who, who need help with, um, you know, moving online uh, to you know, moving their meetings online or, or board meetings, um, you know, answering those questions about conservation activities, doing some like basic looking into status of plants and rare plants. Um, oh, and then, you know, I help out on those, any of the work days, I'm, you know, pretty, got a pretty strong constitution. So I help out with, uh, uh, you know, augering and planting and yeah and you know when the conference was on i was doing a lot of conference organizing so. all right i am ready to take questions if anybody has any well i don't see any questions um let me launch this other poll based on 
what you've seen today, um, uh, uh, I'm asking what area you would most like Passion Flower Chapter to become more active in. Okay, well, it looks like education is by far the biggest area. Um, I see that people have asked some questions here. Um, How many Gail, chapters are there? Gail Taylor asks about the bookmarks that Wendy designed? Yes, I don't, um, we have a couple, I think, that are that are done. Uh, I don't have them. Let me see if I can. So the only one I have is the Meadow Bookmark. That's final, but I think we have yeah, I've, I've seen one on Scrub also. Yeah, so I really, I don't know much about them. I don't do much of the educational. I'm just not in, involved in it. I've, I've had some extensive conversations with Wendy about it, but I really am not <laughs> deeply involved. So I'm sorry, I can't. I, I think that you know, we just haven't had a large budget for for education, um, and the statewide statewide just hasn't been much of a focus. Um, and no, you can't purchase them. We allocate a budget to to print them, and then they're printed and they sit in a box and they get distributed by whoever has them. And so far, so one of the reasons why we have the Teespring store <clears throat> is that you know it has not been a focus of the organization for like us to have stuff and then people buy it and then I sell it. So pre-printed stuff that we use staff time for me to, you know, put in an envelope and sell, like to have a store in that way. Um, this has just not been, I guess, I guess they got burned by that in the past um, that someone had to handle this and maybe it didn't work out. I don't, I don't know the full history. Um, so we would have to, I don't know. That's a that's a board problem, <laughs> not a staff. It's not a staff decision to make on the on that level. But I agree, there is a huge demand. I mean, I can see. I mean, we made like four hundred dollars from the posters last month. Four hundred dollars, and that's just our cut. I mean, Teespring takes a huge cut of that too. And so, I mean, people twenty, thirty, forty posters are being ordered every month by people just because there is a chance to just buy them. And so I think there is a huge demand for purchasing these sorts of printed native plant materials and we're just not filling that need. So if anybody would like to encourage the education committee to change the model so that this, these are available for sale, perhaps in bulk and maybe not very uh, expensive, I think that would be a very good board activity to undertake and something I would be very happy to do as staff. Yeah, Kat, Kathy Perez asks, is it possible to purchase some of the materials to give as gifts? They're really well designed and yeah. great way to do education. I agree, that would be really great. And as far as I know, there is no way to do that now. 
just be, you know, like for example, I have these Moles brochures and I have the discretion I could give them to you <laughs> or ask you to donate to FNPS to get them, but there's no established way for you to buy them and give them as gifts. Yeah, um, Laura asks, how many chapters are there now? Are they in every county? I believe we have 33 chapters now, and no, they are not in every county. The Lake County is the, the exception where there's two chapters per county uh, for that county, but there is no other county that has two chapters and many counties do not have a chapter. So I pulled up the map here. Everybody can still see my screen, right? So I pulled up the map here. We're generally, we're pretty Central Florida heavy. We were founded in Central Florida, um, Tarflower chapter, um, the founding chapter in Orlando. Um, I'm here in Kissimmee. Um, I'm actually, I'm right here. And, you know, it, we have the East Coast chapters, Jacksonville, Gainesville, Sparkleberry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Martha Lynn asks, do you have rescue projects? How do you get involved? Oh, yes. Um, currently, we're doing rescues and planties every Thursday. I would be happy to loop you in as a volunteer. Uh, you can email me and you'll be on the list. How do you get involved? Do you uh, email me and you just show up and you prove that you plant the plant right side up and that when you dig up a plant, you're careful enough to not disturb the root system. You're able to learn the scientific names of the plants that we're uh, digging up. And that's how you become a rescue volunteer. Yeah, the, the other way to do it is whenever Passionflower knows about a rescue project, um, we email all of our members and supporters. Um, so another way to get involved with rescue projects is to um, become involved with the chapter. Um, Donna asks, who does the lobbying with the legislature or what are some of the major issues being addressed now? So Sue Mullins is our contracted lobbyist. Um, the legislature is not in session right now. So this past legislative session, we had two major issues, well, three major issues. We had fully funding Florida Forever, which we didn't get, but we got some money for Florida Forever, which is our land purchasing program, the statewide land purchasing program. And then not building the MCORS project, the Roads to Ruin, not building those. And then we have a license plate proposal up in front of the legislature, which they did sign, but the governor did not sign the bill. So those were our three main things. And I think we actually, um, I have a news item on that. I, we, he, um, Gene did a full legislative priorities. Gene and Sue did a full legislative priorities for 2020. And it was, I mean, a five page document. So if I could find that, that would be really great to share with you so that you would know what issues we addressed in the 2020 session, what positions we took on different bills, because we do take positions on almost every natural resource related bill that comes through the legislature. Um, if you find that, if you would email it to Passionfire, I'll make sure people get to see it. I wonder where I did put that. Okay, well, I'll find it and uh, send it to you, Melanie. Okay, that sounds good. Anyone have any other questions? We have one in the Zoom chat. Lisa asks, a bit off topic for today, but do you know anything about the status of wild lime and the Department of Agriculture requiring systemic pesticides required to be used if propagating and selling? I do not know anything about that but I can ask Juliet. 
Okay. Um, Martha Lynn asked, do you have a picture of the license plate? Which, which I understand is still on hold awaiting gov governor's signature. Uh, it was in the forum, I think. No, yeah, I think it was, but I think you have to have board access to find the pictures. Okay, here's some of the draft designs. Um, Gail asks, with all the great things that are taking place with FMPS, is the word getting out on Google News and other Florida news channels? I know we see this news in FMPS News Info. Okay, so, you know, I work a lot with journalists on Split Oak issues. You know, it's very hard to get journalists to bite on things when there's no fight and there's no drama. Um, we have a few journalists who consistently report on native plant issues and you know, post our events and write on interesting topics, like when we have a cool speaker for local chapters. But press releases, I mean, I've done press releases and they're a fair amount of work for very little return. At least no articles. I've not gotten any articles from any of my press releases. Um, so I am really open to suggestions. I have been very successful in attracting journalistic attention on Split Oak issues and, you know, speaking to journalists and getting on TV, but for native plant issues where there's not so much flash and bang and conflict, I have not been successful in getting lots of news coverage on, on our work. So I am, I am happy to field suggestions on that. Of course, I think what we do is very newsworthy and I'm doing my best to communicate what we do in videos and on social media where I know that people, um, I know that people are seeing that even if they're not journalists. Is there any training for new incoming chapter presidents? Yes, um, I think the training is mostly at these quarterly board meetings. Um, and we did do a board member training um, with the Edith Bush Institute. And I think that included chapter presidents I don't think there's any formal training and that would be a good good thing to adopt for the organization, but we, we don't have anything formal just yet, more like on the job training at our quarterly, at our annual retreat and quarterly meetings. Great question, Molly. Yeah, it is. Um, training is one of the things we're starting to address at the um, Council of Chapters. Because it would be good. I mean, chapter presidents, to be a chapter president, you have to have a great variety of skills. Right. And, and knowledge. And so sort of formalizing what that requires and helping people to get that would be really good. Yeah, there's, there's also a lot of stuff that um, I know that coming in as a president of a chapter, it was sort of a voyage of discovery. And a lot of it, I learned just because I stumbled on something, um, you know, not because there was any way to uh, get training. So I, I think that would be a great thing to start doing. Um, we're certainly um, looking at doing it for chapter representatives, but that could be expanded. 
Okay. Um... Oh, other question from Laura. Can I talk about native plant groups in other states? Do most states have them? Great question. Um, so let's see, the largest, we are the second largest native plant society in, the, we were the third largest native plant society in the country, but the second largest was the Northeast. So that encom encompassed multiple states. So we're the second largest state only native plant society in the whole country behind California Native Plant Society. And you know, California has a much larger population than we do. Um, so the California, um, California Native Plant Society is incredible and huge. And you know, they have a mass of like 20 staff. And the California Native Plant Society basically runs the Native Plant Conservation Commission coalition. Native Plant Campaign. Campaign. So they're lobbying for they had, we had two federal bills this year that had to do with botany and conservation, specifically two native plants. And thankfully I have a good relationship with um, Representative Soto here, the Florida's representative, one of Florida's representatives. And I got him to co-sponsor, uh, me with the help of Jean and Sue, uh, got him to co-sponsor these two bills. And th thankfully I knew about them because of the native plant conservation campaign. Um, and they do get out the vote stuff. They have a lot of information on plant blindness and they're really great. And um, let's see, Native Plant Societies. We do have a um, United States. Mm. I thought we had a, we have a, Yes, North American Native Plant Society. So we do have sort of an overarching organization called the North American Native Plant Societies. And I will drop this in chat so you can see. Um, they, they do list Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, um, Colorado, Connecticut. So you can look through this list yourself. Um, and in our conference that was, that was not to be we worked really, really hard to get the Southeast Native Plant Societies together for a panel. And they were super flaky, <laughs> really hard to get a hold of and get together for a panel. And, uh, um, but we really would like to work more tightly with our United States Native Plant Society organizations because most states have them, <laughs> um, even if they're not very large. And really this is the best way to improve funding for botanists on the federal level, as we've seen from the bills that happened and, and improve requirements for say one of the bills would, would have like, <clears throat> like at, at national parks and other federally administered like BLM have to use native plants in their landscaping and have to hire a, a botanist for one of their positions. So even if they had like a regional position that was a botanist, in many of these organizations, there are no botanists involved. Like for example, if you go to FWC, you'll have biologist, 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 or a bird guy is somebody who does red cockade woodpecker relocation. And you won't have a botanist working on that has any influence in land management. You might, there might be one botanist in Tallahassee, but none working on local botanical issues. So that's my, you got me on my soapbox. Sorry guys. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Lisa asks, is there, are there any plans to add new chapters in South Florida or is, is that even possible? I'm in very Northeast Broward and neither chapter is conveniently close. So we don't have very stringent requirements for becoming a new chapter. And if you are interested in starting a new chapter, um, we would encourage you to have a solid you know, 40 people that you know are current members or make them become members and you have a meeting place and the ability to sustain programming <laughs> and the volunteer core, you know, we're not gonna stop you from creating a chapter. And, you know, there are chapter support payments. You get a percentage of um, the membership from each of the people, but it's a lot of work. So, you know, you'd have to have a president, you have to have three officers and there's nothing to stop you. Just it's just challenging, and 
you know, we'd be happy to help because you know, the more chapters with certain stipulations, the better reach we have. Okay. Um, yeah, I did a webinar by um, the Center for Biodiversity, and they were talking about endangered plants and the fact that um, plants don't have equal protection under the law the same way that the animals do. Um, so it sounds like there are some organizations that are trying to broaden that protection. And that seems like a worthy thing to be working for as well. Uh, Lisa, do you want to post your email in the panel and I can copy you on that, on this email to Juliet for asking her about this. And Martha Lynn is volunteering on getting media coverage. Yes. Okay, so I will email you. Okay. Yeah, it would be really great. The Endangered Species Act basically does not cover plants. Plants are considered personal property. And even if they're endangered, you can take them. Thank you, Lisa. Oh, I can't believe I missed that webinar, the fan webinar. Was it good? Which one? Uh, Lisa said it was brought up at the fan webinar yesterday. Oh, yeah. I know that's that's one of the bad things about the there are some great webinars being done, um, but sometimes <laughs> there are just too many. So I'm so really many. glad that you're um, recording and posting the lunch and learns because it's great to be able to go back and you know watch them. At, at a later time. Yeah, that was one of, I mean, the, the accessibility. So that's one of the reasons why I moved to, to YouTube Live is because it's automatically recorded, easy to trim, and YouTube Live is accessible. YouTube is accessible from almost every device and people are pretty familiar with it. So <laughs> it's easy and you don't have to wait on me to, to edit yeah <laughs> edit the recording because i'm a little overwhelmed with the amount of things that i have to do for this job terrific i don't see a link to this uh webinar or or even the announcement maybe it was a um florida wildflowers webinar Oh, I'm glad you've gone back to watch the watch and learns, Donna. I'm I'm very glad they're helpful. I, I put a lot of work into them, finding the finding the presenters and making sure everybody's tech is good and so I'm glad that people are enjoying them. Maybe they put it on their YouTube. Oh, nothing recent. Well, if anybody finds a link to that, I'd appreciate, you know, an email with it. <laughs> yeah, to, to the fan webinar? Yeah, or whatever webinar was yesterday. Yeah. Okay, I'm putting my email address in here and my phone number in case anybody wants to copy and paste from there. Uh, 
Okay, any other questions? I guess Lisa's, Lisa's looking for a link to the webinar. You can just email me. Actually, she has my email because I just emailed her. So. Right. Okay. So if there is a, if there aren't any other questions, thank you everyone for attending and for your questions and the information you provided and for supporting our organization. And thank you so much, Valerie, for taking the time to do this for us. Of course, yeah, this was really fun, and I'm glad that there's so many people interested in, in you know, what I'm doing, and I uh, hope everyone connects. I hope we can connect better as a state organization with our members and chapters, and we really appreciate everyone being a member and all the hard work that chapters do and chapter members do to promote our mission locally. Well, thanks. Yeah, sometimes we lose sight of what the statewide organization is doing because we're so busy trying to do things at the local level. So this was great to broaden our horizons a bit. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye.